Thank you very much. So yes, my name is Maria Svensk and I work as a communications officer or marketing coordinator for a project that's called the Cultural Heritage Incubator here at the Swedish National Heritage Board. So I'm going to talk an, about an example which is called Hack for Heritage, which was an event that we held in the beginning of October this year here in Visby. But why was uh, the Cultural Heritage Incubator involved? Well, partly because uh, what we do in our project could be divided into two main parts. First, we have an incubator program where we try to encourage businesses and entrepreneurs to uh, develop their innovative ideas uh, in the crossing between uh, cultural heritage data and uh, digital solutions. And the other leg that we stand on are innovation camps or hackathons or the like, where we try to uh, encourage cooperation, idea generating, networking and innovation in this lovely field that we all share called GLAM or cultural heritage and digital solutions. This of course is my view and I might be partial but uh, I think, and I, I'm sure Larissa agrees, that the, the Hack for Heritage was the Cultural Heritage Hackathon of the Year, at least in Sweden. So we held um, Hack for Heritage for the third time this October, and it was the 4th to 6th of October in Swedish National Heritage Board here in Visby. There were about uh, 70 participants, which were divided into 10 teams. And um, the participants were maybe quite uh, unusual for partaking in a hackathon. They were, some were students in different uh, cultural heritage related topics or subjects. Some were UX designers. There were handicrafts, art artisans. Uh, there were museum employees. There were programmers. Uh, one or two hackers like Tim, maybe. <laughs> There were some teachers, there were some marketing and uh, communications experts. So it was a wide spectrum of participants. And they were all here because they are interested in uh, how cultural heritage data can improve their different fields. Uh, and during this hack, we uh, emanated from three different themes, or we tried to encourage the themes to use one of these themes. No, we didn't force them, they could do whatever they want, basically. But we tried to encourage a uh, choice between three themes, and that's where school and learning and education, uh, and points of interest, tourism, and uh, visiting uh, experiences. And the third theme was health, well-being, and cultural heritage. Um, and during this hack, the three-day event, they all had uh, access to our exhibition workshop here in this building. Uh, and in there, there are three uh, exhibition engineers who are very experienced in building good and innovative and interesting solutions for museums. So they could uh, really hands-on help the th teams in their prototype making. And also there were uh, open data avail available, of course, uh, from our partners and from our own sources, and also uh, experts on site to help the participants to use this data. So why do we even do a hack for heritage in Sweden? Well, partly because there's a lot of available open data, as Tim mentioned. It's, uh, a real treasure trove of uh, data, which is not uh, as used as it could be. And also there's a strong digitization and digitalization <laughs> drive in Sweden, uh, in my view anyway. So by doing a hack for heritage, we want to promote or inspire to innovation, inspiration and networking in this area. 
uh, for a wide variety of participants, not mm. only hackers, but a, a wider audience. And it also goes well with the general purpose of the Swedish National Heritage Board, which is to use, develop and preserve uh, the cultural heritage. So this is a, a, a bit more modern take on doing just that. And of course, as I said, the two parts of the Cultural Heritage Incubator is to have a program to help uh, businesses and entrepreneurs to develop their ideas, uh, and also to have hackathons. And by having hackathons, we can maybe uh, get new businesses to arise. Maybe someone get an epiphany and think, oh, this is a very interesting idea. I want to develop this into a new business. At least that is what we hoped for. But we didn't do this uh, on our own at the Swedish National Heritage Board. We had some data contributing partners too. They were on site here in Visby to uh, represent their specific digital archives and collections. So they are the experts on their own data. So uh, this year it was uh, the National Archive and was a collaboration between uh, work site museums and uh, Gothenburg University and uh, Wikimedia Sweden. And of course, uh, other data sets were available too, like uh, the Swedish National Heritage Board's own data sources, but also data from previous Hack for Heritage, which we still have available for the users. So last year it was the Nordic Museum and the Music Government Body. Sorry, I'm not sure about the English name for that. So here's some more Swedish or Swinglish for you. <laughs> just uh, I'm not an expert on these data sets, but I'll shortly just mention them for you. And also, if you want to read more uh, about Hack for Heritage, you can do so on raa.se, which have a shortcut for the Hack for Heritage site. And also there you can find a short uh, video, or short, about an hour, about the team's presentations and uh, what the jury thought about them. I also just shared it in the chat. Oh, good. Well done, you. <laughs> so one of the data sets available, along with experts on the Hack for Heritage, was Kåsam Sök, uh, which is a collection uh, of 7.7 .7 million digital cultural heritage objects for over, from over 60 different institutions. There are photos, artifacts, sound recordings, arts, maps, data, ancient monuments, and uh, settlement information too. And the same goes for Fonsök and Bebyggelse uh, Ristret. That's the record over settlements or buildings we have here. So lots of data around that and much more. So how did it go? Well, it did go quite well, actually. Um, so uh, the link shows uh, the 10 different teams' ideas and th what the jury thought about them. Uh, in the little circle here, you can see um, what was the general opinion from the participants on, a, on the whole. So the blue part here, 73% thought it was really good, 24.3% uh, quite good, and only a, a small portion not so good in yellow. And here's some uh, Swedish quotes for you. Uh, the top one there says, to work in a team where people's differences is an asset rather than a liability. That's the, the best thing that they took with them. Uh, and the second one is, it was so much fun. That's a good grade, I think. And the third quote, to meet others and work with these questions, to quickly work with an idea and to make new contacts. Yeah, so in general, people were very positive and lots of people in my experience, I'm sure Larissa will agree, um, many of them had like epiphanies, like, oh, you can do all this with data we didn't know. Um, 
So that was really fun. Although they were not hackers like Tim, maybe more of them should have been. <laughs> but uh, it was uh, interesting to see how they were so overwhelmed by the possibilities with open data, although maybe they didn't know exactly how to use it at all times. But I really encourage you to have a look at that film, at least if you know Swedish, to see all the fun ideas they came up with during this three-day uh, event. Quite interesting and fun and encouraging too, I think, to uh, keep us going with the, with the work when it comes to cultural heritage and uh, digital solutions. Both of these pie charts are from um, the evaluation we did after the Hack for Heritage with all the participants. So the next question was, how was it to work with open data, in your opinion? And now you can see the grades aren't just as wonderful as the in the general question. So um, most people thought it was quite good, like 22.2% really good. Uh, but also about 20% thought it was not so good. And uh, one or two even thought it was bad working with open data. And that was mostly because they didn't really know how to use it. We had all this data available, like a big smorgasbord, but they like, uh, what to do with this? We're not sure how it works, really. So again, spontaneous translation of uh, quotes. The shorter one, very good. All knowledge about data sources are important and valuable for the work. And the second one, uh, there's a little threshold to get over at first, technically, and then data uh, early. <laughs> yeah. To know what you can get out of the data that you know is there, but you can't really find it. So it was a bit uh, messy with the domains that were mixed a little, and uh, you didn't know what was what. And uh, this uh, corresponds, uh, I think, quite well with what Tim said earlier, that, yeah, it's all there, but you don't really know how to pick out the cherries <laughs> or get what you want from the large quantity of data available. So these are a few uh, creative photos from the Hack for Heritage. Uh, and as you can see, the age is quite mixed too. It's not just uh, hacking teenagers, it's uh, rather quite the opposite. The median age was quite high, I think, and even uh, higher than previous years. Uh, but then again, uh, these people are quite typical of the, at least, Swedish glam sector. Uh, there aren't that many hacking 20-year-olds uh, in this sector in Sweden. So this is a mixture about uh, of uh, hackers or UX designers, but also museum folk and um, archivists and designers and yeah. It's an interesting mix that trying to work together to find new solutions for uh, what you can do with digital cultural heritage. And maybe I should mention, since it we <laughs> put some emphasis that it's not a competition, but of course it was a competition anyway. <laughs> So uh, of the 10 teams, uh, two were voted as winners with the best ideas. And actually you can see one of them uh, in the top uh, left corner, the girl holding a small white screen and a guy in a checkered shirt projecting something on it. They were building a thing called Telepop which was uh, like a telephone booth, booth that you can place somewhere in your surroundings and through it digitally interact with museums which could uh, project data on it. So you can walk into the telephone booth and uh, ask a question to a data source uh, supplied by a museum, for example. So that was pretty cool. Uh, and the other winner was uh, a team that made something called Archaeology the Game. So it was a, a computer game where you uh, 
were a project leader in a archaeology dig. So it was really fun and also they had a really funny presentation. <laughs> so have a look at the film. So in this mixed group of people, what effects did Hacker Heritage have in my view? Um, definitely it increased the awareness of the possibilities within the sector. Like if you know how to find it, you can do amazing things with digital cultural heritage data. Uh, and uh, they also got an epiphany about, oh, there's all these people, all these experts that know so much that if you only know how who to ask, you get again a treasure trove of knowledge. And also from the evaluation, an important part was the networking aspect that you uh, had the opportunity here on Hack for Heritage to meet people that you normally wouldn't interact with, like people from different um, backgrounds and experience and walks of life. And also, uh, generally, people found it very inspiring. They were like, they walked away from here happy, I'd say, with new inspiration to bring home to their own uh, studies or workplaces. And maybe, if we're lucky, some of these uh, participants will be entrepreneurs uh, to develop their ideas in the Cultural Heritage Incubator. I hope so. Some of them were re really fun. And, and again, like a copy-paste on what Tim said, basically. <laughs> uh, but uh, this made me think, though, that since the people gathering here on Hack for Heritage, 70-ish people from different backgrounds and experiences, they choose to come here to Gotland, an island in the Baltic Sea, to uh, hack for heritage, like try to do new innovative cool things with open data. Um, only they weren't hackers, far from it. Like uh, some of them could hardly register to the <laughs> hackathon. Uh, I'm exaggerating. Um, but uh, then who is open data for really? Is it for hackers or people who already know how to use what's available? Or is it in a format that suits the target group? If the participants in Hack for Heritage are the target group for open data, then maybe it needs to be tweaked a little to make it easier to access and to use. Or should we do that? Or should we just leave the APIs and the data open to whoever who can to do whatever they want with it? Yeah, worth, worth to think about, I think. Uh, and this, of course, is uh, considering the participants of Hack for Heritage, uh, like uh, hardcore hackers probably wouldn't have the same kind of problem. But then again, who is the open data for, really? Yeah, that's that short version of Hack for Heritage. Thank you very much for your presentation, Maria. Um, that was really insightful and important to have an example on how institutions can encourage users to actually hack their data and where we also have to get better in designing these kinds of outreach activities. So I now have a question to you. Um, we heard a lot about the participants of these kinds of events and activities, but um, can you share some insights on the institutions that share their data with Hack for Heritage? What have their experiences been like? I'd say they are excited. Like uh, they are also a bit overwhelmed of the possibilities that, oh, we have all this data that we really haven't used much but now we realize we can. Um, so uh, the partners uh, um, experience, I think, are quite similar to the participants, that uh, they know they have all this data, but they also know that they don't really use it as much as they maybe could. So uh, I think they too are like reinvigorated by being here and see all these people trying to do new cool things with their data. And I think that that inspired them to keep working with open data too. 
Yes. And I especially like the title of your last slide, Food for Thought. Um, so how can we actually take these questions further? And I think there have been um, amazing opportunities, both, both in the presentation of Tim and now in your presentation, to actually think about who are we targeting with our open data. So open data is not a goal in, in itself, but we have to actually develop relationships with people outside of the museums and, out, and outside of the sector. Um, to really make um, reuse possible and to enable uh, researchers. And I think yeah. there were great um, points in these discussions. So um, thank you very much to Maria and thank you everyone who joined the session today.